as well, if you guys look at it, right? As we're running for somebody else, we're equally going to be able to accomplish our goals and dreams, or at least get close to them. I always say, shoot for the stars and listen to the moon. Okay? So, we're going to go ahead and get, wrap, get things rolling here. Alright, we're going to start off first and foremost with top personal. So, first one's going to be for top recruits, that's going to be Christopher Vendetta. I definitely do have a, a 
playing and Dan said, I need to go 60 wide. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> a whole different type of thinking. But the thing is, I, um, I have no problem talking about the business. I'm very passionate about the crusade part of the business. But um, we all say this, and it just, you know, at some points, things just land on you at different times. You know, you hear the same things, but certain times you just hear it a little differently. And it finally landed on me of just the opportunity of this business is the best thing you can offer someone. And I finally realized where my disconnect was with recruiting. And it was more of my thought of recruiting, not that I thought it was bad or this, that, or it's hard, but I started thinking I don't want people on my team to think I have to make money off of them. That's really what it was. So I, I really didn't do it, and I was like, I want to show people I can write whether I have a team or not. And then it worked against me. <laughs> you know, I just wasn't building. But once I realized that was what was holding me up, is that I just didn't want people thinking I was using them for money, it allowed me to speak a lot differently about the opportunity. And so what I'm doing is just talking to literally everyone around me, but also being so much more specific with what I'm looking for. So you know we always say, you know, if they're not, you're not getting good feedback from them, <coughs> then who do you know? And I, it's not just a who do you know, I just want to know who do you know that's competitive, like competitive like me. And who do you know that's just driven, completely dissatisfied, but makes a really good income, but dissatisfied with their lifestyle? Because I feel like that's the people on my team that I know I can run with, who are like me. So one of the one of my new um, business partners is the account executive, well, used to be account executive for the Sparks, the WNBA team, and I've known her for years. You know, she's the one who gives us all our tickets. She taught me, she closed us into buying WNBA courtside seats. And I was like, I get free tickets. You know, I was like, if you close me on that, you know what I mean? And I was like, but I never thought about offering the opportunity to her. And then, um, and just acquired a few other things, and I uh, took Nikki's advice of reaching out to James Schwartz, and I've been meaning to tell you the story, so I'll tell it right now, really quick. Uh, James Schwartz was on our, our conference call, and this is the great thing about uh, leadership and leveraging being coachable and being on every call, and he was just talking about, you know, all of this stuff, and he said that he's from the New England area in Boston. And I'm sure he said that before, and I'm sure I've heard it, but now I just heard it then. <laughs> and so I went to Boston for my, my brother's college graduation last weekend and got 15 new names and numbers, and that's where my true warm market, like the people who see me grow up, who have my back, and kind of stuff like outside the family are all in Boston. And his, his S&D or MD out there uh, used to be a basketball coach. He played, he, he and James, I didn't know, they played college basketball, and he coached at... Uh, <laughs> played, played college basketball in New England, and it turns out he knows my brother's college basketball coach. Like, it's just crazy. They're all coaches, they know the thing, and so my brother was like, oh, coaches uh, work in WFG? I was like, okay. <laughs> so now he's engaged and excited about, um, about that and he's staying in Boston. So anyway, it's just really exciting, and I think it just started with, I had to figure out what my disconnect was with recruiting to really be able to move forward. Thank you. Wow.
leadership meeting at the breakout meeting in Vegas on Saturday, August the 19th. And MDs get in that meeting if you're 20000 or more cash flow in 12 months. SMDs get in that meeting if you're $35,000 or more cash flow in 12 months. So you need to be taking a look at your cash flow. You need to know exactly where you're at. You need to make sure that you're getting into that breakout meeting so that you can hear from leaders like that in that meeting. And if you're not an MD yet, who's not an MD yet? Right? Then guess what? You've got time to get to MD. Yes. <laughs> and you need to be focused on at least getting to MD, if not SMD. I hear you. By <laughs> convention. Right? This one's accountable to me every night. Every night she's accountable to me. And we talk about her next promotion or next promotion. Matter of fact, I have about five people that are accountable to me every night without fail. One is Najla, right? Success, because success leaves clues, so let me show you something. One is Najla, one is Sabrina, one is Miss Barbara, one is Delilah, and one is Michelle Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Without fail. Now I've got a lot of people that want to be accountable to me and ask to be accountable to me and say they're going to be accountable to me, Christine, and and you know, all of these, <laughs> one of these, Edson, one of these, right? But what great discipline it takes to actually do it every single night without fail, to actually look at your business and what happened in your business that day, and then say, and then analyze it, break it down, write it down, and then send it out to all of your upline leadership. Right. How, how does that begin to take your business and your mindset and what you got to do the next day, the next week, and your vision to the next level when you're accountable first to yourself? So accountability is about first being accountable to yourself before you're even accountable to somebody else. So give those five people around the clock. They're all here. <laughs> all right. So, hey, one thing I, I was going to um, share with you, I was thinking about when I was listening to Louise this morning, is because um, she was reminding me, right, how long I've been here at WFG, and I think so many times we, um, you know, when we've, we've been in the business, even when we've been in the business two and three and four and five years, we kind of downplay it and beat ourselves up about we should be further along, we should be SEVC, we should be making a million dollars a year, four million dollars a year, we should be, and, and the reality is sometimes you have to look at your business in its totality. And so this past week, I was um, working with several existing clients this past week. And it's so crazy because I have been here, the 4th of July will be uh, 16 years that I've been with WFG on the 4th of July. And I had this past week probably four or five existing clients that I had the opportunity to either have a conversation with, sit down on an annual review with, they just called me because they needed something changed or whatever the case may be. I was sitting with a client yesterday that actually um, my mother-in-law sat down with on my SMD run in 2005. And my mother-in-law was on my team, she was a huge leg, she was my exchange leg, she had like 15 licensed people when she went out to SMD, she, I mean, uh, when I went out to SMD she was a fireball, still a fireball. Still a thorn in my side. But my mother in law. That's why she was your exchange. But she was a court reporter, right? For, for many years. And so many of her clients, when she came to the business, were attorneys and judges and <clears throat> these types of clients. And so I sat down with a guy yesterday who I do an annual review with him every year. And he used to eat. Uh, owns a huge law firm downtown, downtown and he does um, major cases that come up against the police department. So he's extremely successful, yada, yada. And um, so I was sitting down with him yesterday, and he was like, you know, Nikki, he was about to get married for the fourth time. <laughs> and, uh, he's like, you know, Nikki, every time I look at that uh, IE well policy that you and Janelle set up, I don't know, 12 years ago now, I just want to pour more money into it. And I'm like, and, and he does. Every year that I sit down with him on an annual review, he puts between $500 and $1,000 more money into it every month. Literally. And we just watch it grow. It's over $300,000 in his cash flow right now. And we just watch it grow and grow and grow. And then yesterday he's like, well, I want to increase the debt benefit. And I want to put 
put two thousand dollars more a month into it and then we start talking about IRAs and we start talking about you know other different things that that he could do and he's like well why would I do that I just need to put more money into the IUL <laughs> and, and he's like 68 years old and he goes uh and I haven't even started collecting my social security yet and he goes you know what I think I'm going to start collecting my social security I'm going to put that into my IUL can I do that and he's just like fired up about his IUL and so we had tried to get him um, some long-term care, and he had got he had got turned down for for long-term care for for flu because he's actually in great health at 68. But um, but he says, you know what? He says, I don't even need long-term care because I've got so much money in my cash value, in my cash value, in my IUL policy. And he goes, um, hey, can I use the death benefit? And I said, well, if you're terminally ill, right, you could use the death benefit to, to provide for, for illness if, or a terminal illness if, if you had one. And he's like, gosh, how come more people don't know about this thing? So, <laughs> then, so then he opens his doors, right, to, to his law office. He's got about 12 people that work in his law office. And he, uh, he takes me by the hand. He goes, come on. And, he, and we start going around his office. And we start, he's like, this is Nikki Cannon. He's like, I never talked to you before about insurance, but what do you got? You need to sit down with her. And he goes, sit down with her right now. He goes up to his admin. He's like, are you saving for your kids? Come. You need to set an appointment. And he's, he's like, very A-type, like George Jefferson. Oh. <laughs> Literally looks and walks like George Jefferson. <laughs> and so if you're on his staff, even if you're an attorney on his staff, whatever he says, you do. So I'm like booking appointments right and left because he's like, you need to sit down with her. What do you have open next week? Pull out your calendar. Let's see your calendar right now. Like he's just like a type of person, right? And so, so when you look at your business in its entirety, like too many times I think we're just focused on points, recruits, the leaders bulletin, the promotion, the ring, the watch, the this, that. Those, that, that, those are all like, those are really all extras of what we truly are able to do for people. I had another client that called me and said, hey, Nikki, you know, a good friend of ours, his wife passed away uh, from cancer 12 years ago. And one of the things that he wanted to do when he sat down with me, with her open permit, of course, is he wanted to set something up for his son's college because he promised his wife she died of breast cancer. He promised her that he would make sure that their son went to college. And he never remarried. He never had another child. This is his only child. And so this child was two when his mom died. And so he came in and he said, you know, Isaiah's two. I want to set up something up for Isaiah's college. I also want to make sure that I'm set up for retirement, blah, blah, blah. So he went through his whole plan 12 years ago. So he called me the other day and he says, you know, we're talking about blah, blah, blah. He says, hey, Nikki. He says, Isaiah's having a birthday party. He's turning six. I said, Isaiah's turning 16? What? This is insane. So I go online, I look at his um, American Funds 529 plan that we set up years ago. And this child has over $80,000 in just short of a decade saved in his college 529 plan. He's not even graduating yet. Is that insane? Because I sat down and set up a little rink a day, two, three hundred dollars a month into his 529 plan because it was his mom's dying wish that we do that. And he'll be able to, pretty much in a couple, two, three years, he'll be able to write his ticket to whatever kind of super smart, straight A's um, student and go to Lutheran school. And, <laughs> and so he'll be able to write his ticket to college. I had another client that called me and her daughter is going to college and they needed to pull out some money. We had set their IUL up years ago Stunts are in coma. One of my coworkers at WFG. And um, set up an IUL just for her, for her daughters for college. And her daughter's going off to college this September. Called me up and said, hey, you're going to get 20, 30 grand out of that for, for school, for college. Boom. All I got to do is make a call. They cut a check. There's no taxes. There's no 1099. There's no paying it back. It's just, it's just boom. It's just like that. And so when you really think about what it is that we do, because sometimes we're just thinking about when we write the app and, and we submit the app. Or sometimes we're sitting down with a client and they're like, they'll give you the excuses. You know, like I've got a, a client today that I'm sitting back down with. They've 
they've already emailed me. Hey, you love the plan. We, we love everything that you're going to do. But we're right in the middle of escrow. We're buying a house. We're going to have a baby. Everything's up in the air. I just want to make that. I just want to let you know we're probably not going to start today, but we do want to hear what you have. Relationship, one step at a time. <laughs> well, we will be closer today. So, <laughs> because the reality is, if you're in escrow and you're buying a house, right? And we live in Los Angeles, so let's let's be real. These houses are seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars in LA. And you're buying a house, and you're about to have your third child, because they have twins, and they have a third baby on the way. I'm not walking out of there without you having covered. I don't care what you have to say. Period. End of story. How stupid of that would it be for me to have you tell me everything's up in the air? We don't really know. You know, the money's all funny right now. Yeah, the money is all funny right now. And it'll be even funnier <laughs> if something happened. We had a teammate this just this past weekend on our team that passed away in Brazil, just turned 50 in January, went to Brazil on vacation and died of a heart attack. He literally posted the day before he was getting a massage, drinking drinking drinks out of coconuts, giant coconuts, getting a massage the day before and posted having a great time in Brazil, don't know if I'm going to come back home, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then the next day, he dies of a massive heart attack. Just turned 50, right? So there's no way I'm walking out of that house and when you're talking about when things are up in the air, I just don't know. That's how convicted that you have to be because not only is it protection for him now, but I have such the, the, uh, the, the ability to have foresight and I have the ability to have hindsight because not everybody did work be able to help in that manner. But foresight tells me that in 15, 20 years, you'll be calling me talking about, hey, we need to pull some money out for a little Johnny to go to college. Hey, we're starting a business. Hey, we want to buy a house. Right? Hey, I'm getting ready to retire. I have so many clients that call me now. I'm getting ready to retire. Oh my God, I can't. My best girlfriend, her parents, um, my best girlfriend, uh, Ramon's wife, they, they introduced me to this business. Her parents are like, Nikki, everything you told me was going to happen with our retirement 12 years ago has happened. Everything you said was going to happen has happened. And they're able to enjoy their grandkids, be retired comfortably live comfortably and have a great life because of what we're able to do for them. So do not walk out of that family home without making sure that they're set up and protected because in, in decades from now, you will, you will have such a sense of gratitude, not about the rings and the watches and the promotions and the leaders books, but your gratitude will come from everything that this company pays me is nothing in comparison to what these families will have probably even generationally, maybe, because of what you were able to set up and do for them. So, that's my question.
money, and he's obviously the the you know the one making the the you know exactly being the breadwinner for his for his wife and for his family to come here full time just like that. Just have that belief, just like what Nikki was talking about, having that belief and that passion. So that is actually going to be Bernie Sarabia.
know who's going to say yes. So, I mean, just give people the opportunity to say no. If they say no, move on. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, honestly, like, you guys are all here today on a Friday morning. I mean, you guys have made the decision that this is what you guys want to do. And, I mean, this is the best opportunity for us. So, once again, I mean, I just want to push you guys, you know, just get out there, just talk to people. And, I mean, uh, good luck, and I'll see you guys later. <laughs>
many of you know this one? Um, I brought you to this world. <laughs> As I listen to everyone, the message is the same. We're all talking about accountability. Um, I actually tie that with brotherhood. And as you know, where's Christopher? He's not here. Everybody always butchers my last name. I am from the village of Biku, from the tribe of the Ngambais, and I'm the firstborn eldest daughter of Mr. Beyazna. My actually accountability is even stronger than you can see. You know why? Some of you might not even care. A lot of people don't even care that I might be from the tribe of the Biku, that I speak Ngambai, you know? But one thing I've noticed, um, on Wednesday, <coughs> as I left, I was leaving the BPM, um, my amazing, give it up for her, Najma Evans. And he said, Natalie, as I was leaving, I just grabbed my bag as I was walking out the door, she says, Natalie, you're fully licensed and coded. And the minute she said that, I visualized the ocean. <laughs> Everybody knows I love Malibu, I love Bel Air, but white people be quiet, I can't swim. <laughs> I love the ocean. And to me, when I'm presented in front of, or when I stand in front of the water, I see impossibilities. And actually, it keeps me calm. And I see that I can go places that, my God, my God, that is so amazing that my Father in Heaven has set for me. So the minute she said that, I thought, oh my God, she just said that we were coded and fully licensed. So if you don't have anyone that's coded and fully licensed on your teams, think about it. Think about the gift that we've been presented with WFG. Not too long ago, a friend of mine wrote me a birthday card and said, your friendship is a gift. And that meant the world to me. And you know, even more, I had some friends that said, can you be my friend? <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? It goes back to our ethos prospecting. Um, I value your opinion. Because when somebody says, can you be my friend? You're like, wait a minute. This, this means I'm going to have to support you. <laughs> you start thinking about things, but then when you value, when, when you see about um, how much potential people can give you without even you knowing, you realize that um, on our BFS book, on the back of that book, you've got what? The approach? What is it? You guys help me out. We approach, we approach the presentation, I know, the follow up, the start up, and duplication, right? What does prospecting really mean? Mm -hmm. To me, it means what? To search, right? Mm -hmm. But we'll fast forward to duplication. What does that mean? It means to copy. You know how I made it simple for my busy lifestyle? I just thought of search and copy someone like Najma, mm -hmm. someone like Nikki Cannon. Search and copy someone <coughs> who I want to admire, someone whom I want to be like. You see, as a nurse, I always say when you meet people at the point of their painful, most painful moment, that, that's when you find a pivotal moment where you can actually take them to a moment of construction or destruction. And I've always learned that from nursing school. Um, I take care of a lot of wounds, and when someone has a wound that is infected, either if it has maggots, don't get gross out, this is real life, either if you know it's necrotic and it's about to get its limb cut, you realize that that person has more pain and there's nothing you can do. But a healthy wound, which we always say is beefy, bloody, red, has a pain that actually has life, right? Because there's oxygen. So we, each and every single one of us, has a pain, a pain, which is our why, which actually makes us you know, have either a beefy, bloody, red pain, or we can have a pain, a painful why, that actually could cause us to lose a limb or even die, right? Mm -hmm. So my, I guess, takeaway from this is I know as a kid, my parents made us read a lot of books, and Today it serves, but there was a book that my dad had us read, uh, which was uh, Weep Not Child by Mugi Wakiungo. Some of you might know who he is, some of you might not, but he actually, the writer right now, teaches at UC Irvine. And in that book, there's a story of two brothers, and it's the story of loyalty, accountability, and also about just what you can do with uh, what you've been presented with. Uh, I'm not going to tell you any more about the book. You know, I'll spoil it for you. But again, it's about the uprising of the Mao Mao tribes back in the 60s, where um, the white men came to conquer, and you didn't know what to do. People lost their lives, lost their dreams, and everything. So with WFG, there are circumstances. If you look at the back of the BFS, and I don't have it with me to read, there's a quote that I read almost every, every day um, by Dot Richardson. 
and it talks about true champions. You know, and says the key words that I, I think you should have everyone highlight is true champions never give up, right, Michael Paul? They never give up, depending on whatever their circumstances are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my son actually recently has been doing book reports. He's a fourth grader. And, and, and Najla knows him very well. He always talks about, recently he's been writing about Thomas, uh, no, about uh, Einstein, Einstein. And I said to myself, if this boy says Einstein one more time, <laughs> <laughs> mommy, mommy, did you know I would? So he knows I love quotes, because quotes to me are little dollops of education, little dollops of quick pick-me-ups, you know. To me, they're your, they're your B12, they're your vitamins that help you, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there's a quote that Albert Einstein says, a true, true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. I leave you with that. Thank you. Actually had to work today 
So you guys get the pleasure of hearing about me and how I got the... <laughs> teammates and I'm like, hey, am I supposed to meet with you tomorrow? And you're like, no, that's Friday. I'm like, today is Friday. And they're like, no, today's Tuesday. I'm like, today's what day? Okay, um, sure, I think I should go eat right now or something. And honestly, it, it probably wouldn't have happened um, if I kind of wouldn't have got a little bit of a push. Um, James Monroe, leaving and going to Oregon, basically took me from being a fish in the pond to being a shark in the pond. So I went from having to just be James is kind of sidekick, and we kind of ran together, and he helped me out when I needed appointments to, I'm now James. And now running his team and having to oh, help his team. <laughs> oh, also, also, I did get a new coach change. You know, we brought in the reliever, and I now got Christopher now helping coach me and mentor me here in the office. So getting just those two, as well as James, is still calling me every single day to talk to me about something. I'm like, man, you must be driving. You know, just talk. But honestly, he's only encouraging me and putting more, um, building up my confidence and making sure that I continue to move forward and succeed and, and win at all costs. Because when I actually lost my job, he told me, you're either coming to the office to be broke or you come, you're not going to come to my office and be broke. So you're going to come here and make money or you can go get another job. Well, I haven't looked back and I haven't had a job for over eight months. So this is where I'm planting my flag. And I'm planting my flag in so many people's boats and making sure my boat gets pulled along with it. So if anybody needs me to throw my line in their boat, let me know. I'll go in there and we get to run.
the meeting after the meeting after the meeting, you know those meetings, um, they had us get up and talk about our run, what run we're on. So I walked into the BPM on Wednesday, surprisingly, one of my recruit is recruiting, but he's recruiting a lot in Atlanta. So I'm following that team, I'm following the team that I have in Corinth, and he says, you know, we have one more life in ages. I say, yes, that's all I needed towards my MD run. Now I'm working on the points. So to get up in front of the team and just show where you are and all the license agents, and I look back and I say, wow, it's been a journey. But you know what, it's been a great journey. Because now being in the business full time, I say, not in the office every day, but I have an office at home, so I really do work in my business. I make sure that every day I'm working on myself, not only developing who I am, so I can share that with my team, and also to be able to run a business that's gonna be giving me the lifestyle that I want. Mm -hmm. I'm accountable to Nikki, not only because she's my leader, but I have to be accountable to myself. Because when I'm accountable to myself, I make sure that I do the things that I say I'm gonna do. I might not be in the office, but I'm making my dials, I'm meeting my baseline. And that started with when Mark was coaching us all the way from Colorado. He would be on the phone with us every Monday evening, and I knew that if I would get on that call and I did not have my basic point, it's to me, it's like I'm letting myself down and the team down at the same time. So I've followed that ever since then, and it's been, where's Mo? We've been with, when did we start with Mark? I'm going to say August. August, yeah. And to this day, I can tell you, when I don't meet my baseline, it's a very sad day for me. So I work on myself every single day to make those calls, to make sure I have guests invited to the BPM, working on my team, and it feels good to be halfway to my MD promotion, just need to work on the points. But I thank you guys for listening to me this morning, and I appreciate you.
couple things, but just really, really quick, because you guys probably missed it. Well, Christopher, if I'm going to bust on your training or anything, I'm really, really sorry. But <laughs> Christopher has been showing up in ways in leadership. God has been busting open things inside of my soul and inside of my heart and my mind like mad. Christina, Christine, you mentioned about the recruiting and not wanting to go out making them feel like I'm wanting something from you. Um, this ties into Natalie, or Nikki. Okay, I'm going to get everybody's name off. My name is Carol, by the way. Little inside joke for those of you guys who can be on my side. We do laugh because it's so much fun. Um, when Nikki was up here talking about the overall arching uh, of, of your, your business, right? And you could see it oozing from her, that it was, it was the things that she does for families and the things that happen down the road and all the things that she's able to give. That's what I get from my massage therapy practice. And this is a lot different than massage therapy, but I realized this morning from Nikki's speech that it's not different at all. Eventually, if you stick with it, you're going to get the same kind of rewards where you're going to have people being more relaxed, more fit, more financially healthy, and able to do the things that they want to do. Last night in training, Christopher asked us, he was talking about recruiting, and he said, you know, why? Why do you recruit? And he asked us to take a few minutes and write down our top five reasons. My top five, and I'll end with this, number one, WFG is the best company ever, period. Yes. Number two, I want to see the people that I love get paid. Yeah? Number three, I want more people out there helping families. Number four, I cannot save the world all by myself. Christopher did mention there was one man who did. <laughs> and the fifth reason is a party is so much better with more people, right? She's working three jobs. I don't know what she's going to do. 
Well, she called me up and she said, can you help me out? I said, I'm thinking to myself, now you call me, he's deaf. So what am I going to do? <laughs> right? But she had actually listened to me and she bought a life insurance policy. Not through me, don't ask me why. Family members are like that, right? Mm -hmm. But she did it. And that really touched my heart. I said, she did it. She listened to me. She did it. So I was very proud of her. And so I'm just, that happened and, and other things happened in my life, but I actually want to tell everyone, really, really search to see what your why is, and then remind yourself every single day when you don't want to pick up that phone, when you don't want to call anyone, when you don't want to go on an appointment, when you're having a bad day, just think of your why. And then prospecting and recruiting is really just sharing that why and letting people know where you want to go so they can follow you. And that's what you're doing. Yeah.
because we do have great leaders. Our, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, trainings that we do there, and we are very thankful to uh, all our SMDs there, Adam, uh, Adam and then Adam De Leon, uh, Jim Fortajada, and Jared Coligado. They really want to make sure that we are all trained well, so we, we have meetings after the meetings. We do the B BFS uh, regularly so that we can uh, actually like know what we're doing. Um, and not only that, but we are very thankful to all our um, teammates that are there. Uh, actually, each of us uh, have a healthy competition, but then again, each of us also try to work hard to support each other. Um, even though it's from another team, we, we support them because we wanted the, all everybody in that office to be successful. Um, very, very, very thankful for our daughter and our son-in-law because they're the ones that really, really driving our team. Um, we both are MD, but um, we they really drive our team. Um, of course, uh, now in our office we have a lot of millennials and they really can relate to them. <laughs> so um, they're out there every day uh, doing most of the work. And we know that we're supposed to actually recruit more. And so we wanted to, um, uh, by the way, two of our teams uh, actually are, um, because of, what, of the encouragement that we do, they actually got sprint awards. So that's two of our um, new recruits. And then um, actually we wanted to make sure that we work hard and we recruit more because we know that by not recruiting and getting why, we're not going to be able to find our whys, which is help more people and be able to find our mission. <coughs> so that's, that's our why. Four different uh, stories and things that have happened as I self-assess, and there's many more. There's 
tons of them. I mean, I, I'm pretty good at breaking down what I'm not doing and what I am doing and all those different things. But one of the things that I found was, uh, and it started where, you know, Christopher always said to me, he says, Edson, you'll never know how good you really are until you're put in a position where you're actually able to show your greatness, right? And so, uh, and one of the things that, and it's true, right? Sometimes you can, you work hard and you prepare and you're preparing and you're saying, when's that moment when you actually get to see how good you really are? And for me, a couple months, it was actually a little bit over a month ago, uh, Doug actually shared with me about an appointment. Many of you probably heard it on the call, but uh, I want to talk about it because it's amazing how, uh, you know, proper preparation per, uh, you know, puts you in the right position to do things that sometimes you don't know until you're in that place. And uh, there was a time where I'd be nervous if you told me that I'm about to meet with a family who brings in half a million dollars a year and you have to help them, I would be nervous, right? And Doug says, hey, I have this doctor, we didn't know how much money they made, and I get into that, and we get in there, and there are two PhDs, right? Uh, family medicine, one's an anesthesiologist, but what I found was, I may not have a PhD, I may not have a master's, but I took them to school when it comes to my world. Woo! Right? And so, so what happened was, they're over here talking, and you can be, do not be intimidated by a person's professional title. That's their territory. Let them be great where they do, but you be great at what you do. Right? Yeah. And so what happened, and they're over here trying to tell me, well, I won't have these ideas, I have these ideas, and I broke it down. I said, you could go that way, but this is what's going to happen. You could go this way, but long story short, I'll share this with you. When it came to the close, and they maxed out everything they can do, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. But then the one, uh, the, the the spouse, the wife, says, "Don't show me life insurance. I don't want it." <laughs> Those are the easiest. And I said, "Fantastic!" And I shared this story with Christopher, and it was awesome because I sat down with them, and Doug was there. Right? I was like a kid in a candy store. I was fired up because she didn't know what's coming. Right? <laughs> and so my goal, literally, and I prepared, and I didn't. I knew I was going to close. It wasn't my job to close her. It was my job to just help her understand why she wants it, not why she needs it, right? And so one of the things that I shared with her is also she came in, and I asked Doug, I said, and I, we closed the appointment, but I told Doug my level of awareness has changed to where I was talking with them, and I told Doug, when did I close them? Right when we debrief. Hopefully you're debriefing your guys and asking them questions. Stop talking to them, ask them, right? Because sometimes when you're telling them something, that doesn't mean they're grasping it the way you want them to grasp it, Doug says to me. He says, well, when they said, let's move forward. And I said, Doug, I closed them an hour before that happened. Mm -hmm. Right? We were literally going through uh, the illustration, and I showed him, Christopher, see, sometimes some of us miss meetings. They say, don't miss a meeting. I almost missed one, and the one that I almost missed was the one when Christopher talks about. He breaks down costs before he breaks down any benefits. Mm -hmm. And I start that process, and one thing happened that changed. So she goes about, all right, let me see this. Right? Mutual phone was easy. She's like, cut the check. But when it came to the house, she says, okay, see what you got. And then one thing happened where she's looking at the paper. Her eyes go wide and she smiles. And I said, that's when I close her. So are you looking for the right things? And I said, boom, I took them to school and I was so fired up. So now my elevation, the way I talk to somebody literally has evolved, right? They say you don't want to recruit away from an explosion. Hell, you want to want one appointment away because your identity can rise at any moment, right? And so, but I was, and then so, and also the way I'm asking for referrals, and that's a different conversation I'll be getting into, because in the second level of assessment that I shared was, so that's another one, right? My level of identity has just risen because I finally saw what I could do, and I can even do more, right? And so, the second thing that I self-assessed on was also my body, right? And so, I'll share this with you guys, so one of the things I'm excited about, after Tony Robbins, one of the coolest things that I've done, uh, you know, is I wanted to get my body back in shape. Have you guys ever looked in the mirror and said, that's not who I want to be? Yes. yes. Right? So I was looking in the mirror, I finally was fixing this, and I'm like, man, I feel great, I'm doing great, I'm moving in the right direction, but the person in the mirror, I can't stand because that's not me. Because when I close my eyes, that's not who I see. And I said, well, who's got to change it? Me. Right? And so what happened for me was, and Nikki talked about this in 2015, it was at the convention, I don't think she even remembers, but Eric Olson was on stage, and she said, see, I remember all this stuff, it's crazy, but I still remember the conversation. She talked about sometimes in order to make uh, changes outside of your business, right? So sometimes you want outside results, sometimes you got to make changes inside, right? And, I, and so I made the decision, I said, hey, let's get back in shape, but I see I made the mistake last year, I did the same thing around the same time. Last year, I actually got a personal trainer, paid the dude 3500 bucks to teach me how to lose weight. What was the problem? I said, I wanted to lose 30 pounds, right? I was two, 217 pounds. I wanted to get back down to 285, uh, or excuse me, 185. <laughs> 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 I said, we were 185, 
right? So I want to go down to 185. Well, what was the problem? So I'm working out with this dude. I'm accountable to the guy, but what I was focused on was hitting the weight. I was not focused on building a habit. Mm -hmm. So I cut the weight. I got down to 195 and went back up. Why? Because I just showed up because the guy told me to show up and I paid him so I didn't want to lose the money, but I never built a habit of building the right lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So what habits are you creating in your business, right? So now I'm down, I'm down right now, I'm down 18 pounds, but I'm not clapping for the 18 pounds because I don't care about the pounds. What I care about is the habit and the consistency because now it feels weird when I don't go to the gym, right? But how do we train? <laughs> so, so how does that translate into business? Phone calls, prospecting, right? So then you self-assess. So those are strengths that I found in myself. Well, I don't call them weaknesses. I call them undeveloped strengths, right? That's one of my favorite motivational show speaker, Eric Thomas, says he's called undeveloped strengths. They're not weaknesses. They're just undeveloped, right? Like a muscle. And so how do we go from the negative side? So I'm, as I'm self-assessing, how many of you guys say, hey, I prospect as I go? Right? How many of you guys prospect as you go? Go back three months and see how many prospects you actually have, and you'll see if you're prospecting if you go. Because when I look back at my numbers, I went back, I keep track of all the names and numbers I get. Hopefully you're writing them down, not just on your phone. Hopefully they're on paper so you can visualize them. But if you go back three months, see how many actually names and numbers did you get? Right? It's scary when they say you should have 25 new names and numbers a week and you get less than 25 a month. You got a problem. No wonder you're zero, zero. Right? So when I'm self-assessing, I don't care how good I am at the skills. If you're not talking to somebody, you don't get a number, you don't get a recruit, then you're wondering why everybody else is passing you, right? There's no S in front of my title. And that's because I'm not doing the daily habits I should have done. So that's a self investment on me, not on anybody else. Right? As my peers are moving, does that mean that they're better me in skills? No. What they've done is they're consistent with their activity. Right? And so that's one of the things I had self-assessed is when it comes to prospecting. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I getting names and numbers? Last week was the first time in months that I got 25 new names and numbers. And it's a, if there's a reason I have eight appointments next week and they're all for recruiting. Right? There's no, there's a correlation there. But... See, what happens is we get deluded as you get longer in the business. When you're newer, the numbers seem to play in your favor. But when you get a little bit seasoned in the game, you still think that your skills got better, you need less numbers. No, you still, you're, trying, you're not playing the game anymore. Right? You're trying to play your game. And that's what I found out. Where I'm over here getting 10 names of numbers and discouraged because nobody showed up. And I'm thinking I'm, over, I'm better than the numbers. And so now as I'm assessing it, I'm like, well, you can't get mad at the game when you're not playing. And so that's where I'm at right now, right? So I have self-assessing those things. Same thing with accountability. I don't want to get into that. I've let, I haven't let Nikki down for not being accountable. I've let me down for not being accountable to her. I don't feel bad because what she's going to think of me. Because I know with her, she's just, she's a classy, she's a leader. She's the most powerful, uh, she's one of the most powerful leaders I've had in my lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that she's just waiting for me to show up, she's there. I let me down by not being accountable to her. But why am I not accountable? Why are we not accountable? Because we got to see what we're not doing. Right? So those are the self-assessments. So we got to look at that. That's, of course, the questions we got to make. And then the last one is self-assessment of I'm not giving my team everything of me. Right? So I'm over here telling my team, hey, you got to do this, you got to do that. But when's the last time I took time to really develop my guys? <coughs> I'm over here thinking they should already have the ASAP by now. Well, how many times have you spent time with them teaching it? So, or are you just expecting them to book appointments? When's the last time you went on an appointment by yourself and you said, man, I should have called somebody so they can sit down? Most of my appointments now have no more than, uh, have, le have no less than three people. Right? Who are you to tell someone they can't sit in the corner taking notes? They're not going to care. And if they say, hey, then if they say, well, just tell them ahead of time, just pre frame it like we do everything else. Hey, there's a dude that's going to be taking notes. Don't worry about him. He's just trying to be the next trainer in the office. I wasn't doing that for a long time. And I was wondering why my guys weren't learning. And then they quit because they're not making money. But what do we say? They didn't want it bad enough. No, I, didn't, I wasn't a great enough leader for them. Stop looking at, stop pointing the finger at them. Start saying, are you doing what you're supposed to do? Yep. 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 Woo! Right? That wasn't me. I can't be SMD if I don't train like one. Right? Right? Or you can be an SMD and not act like one. So stop chasing the title. Be better you. Be better you. Right? And so those four things in my area, and there's so many things I can share, but as far as time, I don't have it, but I'm just telling you, spend time on yourself. You can read all the books. You can listen to all the audios. You can come to the VPN. But when's the last time you spent an hour with yourself and be real with you and make those adjustments? Right? Self-assessment is one thing that people don't do. Right? But when you actually do it, you'll be surprised at what you can do when you aren't doing, and now we can move forward. But 
Sometimes you gotta be honest with yourself, and I'll tell you here, I'm not, I'm very imperfect. I'm the most imperfect people. We all have challenges. We all have seasons, right? But at the same time, I've gone through a lot of battles. Understand, many of you have gone through your battles. I've gone through mine in my head, and with the things that I've had to go to, and that's a whole different story. But guess what? I'm winning the battle, right? Every single day, you show up, you win the battle. But the thing is, are you doing the right activities to get to the next level, to do all those things? And I think that's where we're heading right now in the desert. I think we're finally in the right place. I think the best version of myself, I'm just in a new evolution of myself, right? Not in a whole new level. I'm in a whole different dimension of where I want to go in my life. But it's time to take those actions. But first, got to be self-aware of them. So that's all I got for you guys. Right. <laughs>
And I tell him, well, I have one. She's a world-class assistant, but she's also my world-class boss. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so Sarah's like, hey, wifey, can you please do this? And she goes, what did you say? You have to be doing this right now. Look what it says right here. I was like, holy smokes, yeah, you're right. Oh, man. And she, she pushes us, really. And I'm, I'm really, she's, she's the fire that lights my butt every day, every morning. <laughs> and if I seem lazy, and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, you're right. I'm not doing anything. Let's go. we got to do something. And, you know, um, every day I'm just put in a position. And I like what Ed said. You have to increase your identity. Every day you're going to be sitting down with someone. And you don't know, but one day you're going to run into that one person that's just going to change your life. <laughs> that's just what it is. It could be a recruit. It could be a piece of business. It doesn't matter. Because uh, I was talking to my father-in-law, mother-in-law, and one day we just... Uh, I'm not going to be very specific, hypocrites, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, I, I, we, we, just, we just had a heart to help. And it said, you know, we want to go to this appointment at another state. And we sat down with them, and he said, we don't care how much they have or how little they have. Let's just help them out, because maybe one day they're going to give us referrals. But we didn't know that this client might actually have the ability to change our lives forever. You know? And every day it's like, you know, why are we afraid? When they, when they give us numbers, like, why are we afraid? Every day we've been preparing for that moment. I've been treating every client like a million dollar client until one day you were actually run into one. And it's just like a normal client. <laughs> That's just what it is. But I want to, you know, every, everything that we do, even just the little things, it's the little things in this business that's really going to get your business going. You may ignore it, but that's why I brought my wife here. And she's going to talk a little bit about <laughs> tracking. It's like, hey, Mark, hey. It says right here, you didn't send a tape, thank you note. How come you didn't send a thank you note? Do I have to send a thank you note? Okay, white people, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? So here I have my wifey. She's my world class assistant, but she's, a re she's also the reason why I'm getting paid really well. Yeah. So, uh, she's going to share a few nuggets. Uh, um, I just want to first thank you, uh, yeah. thank our first um, Transformers and friends. So we, three years ago, we started out in, in Ontario in Gloucester. We moved to office. We moved to another office in Ontario. Then we were able to move, and, and um, under the leadership of Jerry Colagato and um, Gene Forcato, we were able to open up an office in, in residence. And it has been, and and think, and also we have a really good trainer, um, Adam. And it's been a, a really big whirlwind of three years. Um, but I would not change one minute of, um, it's like peak and valley, peak and valley. But it has been an amazing three years, and. Um, I, I'm really thankful to my parents. We, a little bit of our story. We, we came back from our honeymoon and literally right after our honeymoon, mom said, you need to go and sit down with Francis. And I said, what is this again? Like again, another business you're getting into. So, but we sat down with Francis and I felt sick to my stomach because the, everyone, what I heard, I was like, why don't more people know about this? This is like sickening that we, we're not, like we don't, from high school, we're not educated about finances, right? So um, I sat down, I told my husband, you better join, what's up, let's both join. Me. I closed him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so then we joined, and I, um, so I'm really thankful for our leadership. And also, just just about, you know, a little bit of tracking. Um, yeah, I really, it, you know, uh, we were learning about tracking through um, Adam. We were doing tracking, but we were really doing, like, very good tracking. We have, um, he's really, like, encouraged us to like, have a nice binder, have your, like, you know, have every single month. I don't know how you guys do track, but I do my, my tracking by months, so that when May is done, I'm gonna put it in a folder, so that next year when I go back, I know who I'm gonna do with my, my, my annual review. Ooh. So I, and that's a little nugget for you guys, that you can just put it away by months. Um, and then I just, you know, I don't know if you, how many guys are on campaign manager, but that is excellent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, really, I mean, before we were writing cards, like, thank you, hold my hand. But now, you can just send it, like, digitally, because, like, you know, we're in the digital age. So a lot of people are used to, you know, getting emails and, but it's, it's really changed because you are able to contact lots of people um, in, in a short amount of time and you can just send out bursts. So I really encourage you guys to, you know, to look at those things. And like, like uh, Edson said, it's those little daily habits and that we need to change and assess for ourselves because those things, the days that we don't want to do it are the days that really can change our lives. So thank you. Um, and we guys will see you guys at the top. <laughs>
with some of the things, if you don't have a good support system going with you, I think it would be hard for you to actually push forward to some of those tough, 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 tough times when you're hitting some of those lows and you need somebody just to push you up so you can actually get started on those next things. And the next gentleman I actually want to bring up, the reason I kind of talk about that couple and having someone push you up, I hear them on a daily basis, did you get your calls done? Did you call this person? Have you submitted this? And also hearing him on the phone, he steady Eddie every day. It's the same type of call. He calls them, he calls either resumes or business cards or following up or talking to his old clients, talking to some new clients. And I can go to him from a wealth of knowledge because he's been in the industry for now 25 years. So definitely can tell you front and back the BFS as well as almost front and back the actual industry. So top recruiter for top SMD, I'm going to bring up Mr. Steven Adams. <laughs> Top 
MD recruits there. But um, that is going to be uh, Jerry Caligato and some steady eddies in here and some people would any of you guys like to have a steady glossary to understand how insurance works what's the best product to give people yeah. and not have to figure it all out by yourself yeah. Yeah. like to maybe just walk with something and they go yeah. you go man let me just type this in like this computer and go oh yeah spit me out the answer well guess what I got two of those people here in this office who I can constantly just go to and go to and go to and they have tons of knowledge and tons of feedback and again another steady eddy if you get into the office by 9 o'clock you're going to see this guy here coming in with his lunch pail, and at about 11 or 12, you'll see him doing his little daily walk before he eats his lunch, yeah. and then he takes his lunch out because he wants to get out of the office, he wants yeah. to eat it, and take his little, his me time, and it's <laughs> funny because you can consistently see this guy doing the exact same thing, and you see him winning yeah. month after month, hitting his goals and hitting the things that he wants. He even just challenged us just last week to kind of step out of our own box, and it really has allowed me to elevate my game and actually change some of the things that I was doing as far as planning my day and get prepared and really challenging myself to make sure that I stay focused on what I'm doing on a daily basis. So I want to bring up Mr. James Jim Maloney and Woo! represent the team. Woo! that we say that you may not be able to hear. 
So I want to challenge you, and I, I personally, I, I, don't, I don't typically do this with my team, but John and Hope, you need, you need to be in that meeting. You, you really do. And I know you're not that far away. I, I know they can make it. A, a, you, they had the number one training associate. Five. Number one training associate, director John and Hope, uh, Cameron Thomas. You guys have probably never even met him before. Cameron's part-time with us. Cameron is a validated field trainer, and he has a full-time job. And it's been a while since he's been out in the field, so he <clears> called me up and said, hey, I got this client. Um, I think she has some money to roll over. He goes, I want you to go out with me. And basically, I just watched Cameron do it. And then him and I got together and figured out what to do for the client. She's uh, in her 50s, uh, lives with her mom. She's on disability, doesn't have a job. Um, doesn't have a house, doesn't have a family, never been married. You know, I, I don't think you get much more than a zero pointer than that, right? <laughs> and uh, we go and sit down with her, find out she has $100,000 sitting in an old 401k that she's never done anything with. And she's going to be inheriting, who was talking about the million dollar clients, treating everybody like they're a million dollar client? Uh, she's going to be inheriting a million dollars. So, um, but the reason you need to get to that meeting is because I think this is the best meeting we do every month. And I think that meeting, when we get trainers in there, like we did today, is probably the best training that we do every every month. So anyway, going back to what Louise said, there's a couple of things that she said. She took us all the way back, like I said, when we first started here. And uh, the funny thing about Louise, she was talking about when she started, uh, we didn't have the kind of training that we have here today. And I thought back on that. There was, there was no classes like we have now. We didn't have area wide. We didn't have. We didn't even have full timers. No. It was. We do a BPM. Free yeah, game. Yeah. <laughs> we do. We do a BPM, and then and then somebody would go. You know, we should probably do something for the uh, for the licensed people. So the licensed people would go out and, and listen to somebody that's been out in the field. Right. Right. Everybody else would go in the BPM. And that was our training. And uh, when she was talking about that, she goes, "But there were pluses to that too." And the pluses were. Nobody questioned what we did. What we did, like there, were, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of explaining or a lot of training. She said people just went out and did what it was we <coughs> told them to do, and they didn't question it because they had, they had no reason to question it. She said she was so afraid of doing the wrong thing for a client that she never questioned what Dan told her to do, ever, because she was so afraid of doing the wrong thing. And I think what we've gotten to the point of is we, you know, I don't think you could have too much training, but I think we've gotten to the point to where we're, we're more about training than we are about doing, because doing is where you learn how to do this business. You don't learn this business in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she brought us back to that, I kept thinking about what that office was like when we were out there. It was so funny. We were in a diamond <coughs> office sharing it with some other hierarchy, and most of them didn't speak English, the other hierarchy. And it was so weird because, it, I don't know how, Christopher, how you guys worked this out, but it seemed like we were there during the day, and then they were there at night. Yeah. So we almost never saw each other. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was so weird how that office was set up. I never met any of those people, I don't think, because I was, I was there only like <coughs> during the day. But anyway, so um, I, I just want to give a couple things that I think that most of you are probably ready to hear. And uh, that was one of them. Is, is I, I think we do. She says we do. We do way too much. Too much explaining. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was something that we should probably think about. The other thing that she said is that, and I'm sure all of you have heard this before, but she says, she said people buy on emotions. They don't buy on what you say. They buy on your passion. You know how passionate are you about what we do? And she said recruiting people. People, people get recruited for your, if you show them your vision, your passion, and your certainty. Um, and he, she also said we don't sell this business big enough. So when she said vision, she meant, I've got to believe in your vision for you to recruit. And you've got to be passionate about it, and you've got to be certain about it. Um, and this is so funny, too, because I remember when Louise would be in the office making calls. And uh, this is actually 100% true what she said. she said. She said recruiting is a game for her. She just makes it a game. She's on the phone. She's talking to people. They tell her no, and she goes, oh, I got this person. I'm just going to make it a game. She doesn't put too much pressure on herself. And uh, I also want to point out something that, Nick, that Nikki said today that really kind of hit me. I think it kind of hit home with me, is about accountability. 
and I've heard this a hundred times, probably a thousand times, that accountability, accountability is not for you, not for the person that you're giving the accountability to, it's for you. And But she, she put a little twist on it, I don't know if you guys heard this, she said, accountability is really about being accountable to yourself. And Edson said the same thing, look in yourself in the mirror, right? That's what accountability is. It's not, it's not for the person that you're being accountable to. It's not even for your numbers. It's, it's for you to know in your, for yourself what you did that day. That, that's really what accountability is for. So um, I just wanted to say um, one more thing that Edson said about taking people on appointments with you. Um, I was talking to one of my agents today, and I, and I thought about this. I have, I have about 400 personal clients. They call me all the time. I do annual reviews with them. And I can't remember the last time I took one of my agents with me to go on annual review. And then Edson just, just like that, Edson says, well, all you do is you just tell the client, uh, I'm going to bring this guy with me. He's going to be taking notes because he's going to be the next trainer in the company. I just thought, why don't I do that? It doesn't make any sense. I should be doing that every single time I go see a client. And that's something that I need to change. Um, and then about the standards. We were talking about the standards here in the office, and Maurice brought this up last week. We do uh, full-timers every Monday, and we take turns, all the SODs take turns training. And I just thought about the standards around this office, and I thought, what's the best way to get people to step up and, and raise the standards in the office? So I came up with 10 things that I wanted to see change in this office, and then I added a $5. All I added was $5. I said, anybody that wants to do this, put $5 in the pot. And I want to recognize Isabel for winning the, winning the pot. <laughs> She did nine. She did nine, and, and you have to do. You have to, you have to do everything consistently for for seven days. So she did. She did nine of the ten things consistently for seven days. So I just want to recognize that. But um, but I did that because I want to raise the standards. And and I don't know if those of you, that, well, a lot of you weren't in that meeting. But the reason that I did the contest was actually not for Isabel, not for anybody who was in the contest. I did it for me because those are the ten things that I need to work on. Those are the ten things that I wrote down. On there. And, and one of the things I realized, and I don't know if I realized it today or maybe last Monday when I did the training, but um, uh, the only way for my team to grow is for me to personally recruit. And uh, I've got a great team, John and Hope, you know, Cameron, we've got people in Arizona, we've got people I think in Nebraska now, because that's where John's from, if you guys didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, but the thing is, uh, you've got to set the pace for your team. You have to be the one. It can't, you can't rely on your team, obviously. You, you've got to be the one to set the pace for them. If you look at Charlie, if you look at Christopher, if you look at some of the leaders around here, Nikki Cannon, they lead their offices. They're, they're the ones that set the pace for everybody else. And, and all of you can do that. All of you can be the leaders for your team, and that's how you do it, by personally, personally recruiting, personally getting guests down here. So I just want to leave you with that. Thank you.
pushing them. He's constantly pushing them to be um, better. Not honestly, not just in the business, but spiritually, especially. I know that's something that he's, yep, he's uh, huge on, and he just, you know, helped me out yesterday. We had a good conversation, but he just puts his head down and. He works, and he's always there for everyone in this office, and um, any office really. Someone needs help, and he's always there to, you know, help them out. So, being recognized for SMD uh, points is Ricky Monte. <laughs>
Like Ricky, once I heard that, I go, okay, I gotta send you numbers. Okay, I haven't been consistent in like two months, so let's talk about it. Be consistent real quick. And one day I sent him some numbers not so high, and he goes, cool, so you're gonna make that up tomorrow. And I was like, yep, sure am. So I knocked out 74 points that day. So hitting the 80 today, I don't think it's gonna be a problem for me, but just know that you guys are gonna get some great nuggets, some great nutrition, great information today. And I could not be more blessed to bring up Mr. Christopher Slater. <laughs> Sometimes in the pursuit of significance, we feel like we are missing out on loving connection, right? Nikki talked about her client, his, her client that's changing his beneficiary for the fourth time, right? <laughs> she needs to do an annual review just to keep up with the beneficiary change, right? Sometimes we get so much loving connection and we're lopsided and don't get enough significance. So, we have... Wants and we have needs. Before I get to that, the last two, growth and contribution, are not the needs of the personality, they're the needs of the community. Good guess. They're the needs of the spirit. Oh. The needs of the spirit. Not spirit, the spirit. Growth and, uh, growth and contribution. Okay. So, <clears throat> how does this play into what I sort of wanted to talk about today? 
How many of you have things that you want to achieve here at the WFJ? Say aye. Aye. Here's what I want you to understand. People will do almost anything to get what they need. They won't do almost anything to get what they want. want. Now, and when, when I'm talking about needs, I'm talking about a real inner human need. In other words, you're like, I need to make more money. I need to get my family out of debt. I need to be a better provider. I need to become an MD. Those aren't really needs, even though sometimes we they feel like a need. But those really are as wants. They're really wants. Okay? So what I want to just touch on, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about recruiting and a recruiter's mentality, but <clears throat> I want you to understand where a lot of times people in these meetings and the meetings we do on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays, we, we recruit like so many wonderful people to our hierarchies, to our teams, and to this organization. Think about it. Um, my hierarchy is recruiting about 1,200 people a year. I don't know what Francis is in. And Jared, do you know what all the help that you do, Francis, with the recruiting in a year, the hierarchy? <clears throat> don't? Okay. So 1,200. We're, so that's a lot of people coming in. Yep. Do most people succeed? Yeah. No. Why don't most people succeed? Believe. Believe. Okay, sort of the global blueprint. I think that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. oh, Usually distracted and defeated. Distracted, defeated. Focus on where they're at. Excellent. I throw out God's timing. God's timing? Okay. No wants. No wants. So I, let me take you, it, a lot of it has to do with wants and needs. And a lot of it has to do with sort of the ecosystem or the environment or the culture that we have here. And I want you to see some things. I want you to make a decision to make some shifts with you and make some shifts with your people. Because some of you have been training associates or associates or senior associates or MDs way too long. Others of you have been SMDs way too long. And there needs to be some shifts. So what happens is, is we get caught up in what I call the training paradox. Well, we think I need more training. I'm not a good recruiter because I don't I haven't gotten enough training yet. I'm not a good personal producer because I haven't gotten enough training yet. I'm not a good prospector because I haven't gotten enough training yet. I'm not the VPM presenter because I haven't gotten enough training yet. I don't get a good one-on-one -on -one because I haven't done enough training yet. And what we have is a lack of training, and that's the reason that we're not achieving things inside of WFG. And yet some of us come to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting and are on conference call after conference call after conference call, never miss a big event, so we're getting tons of training. But what we're lacking is experience. And there's a big difference between experience and training. At a human needs level. And here's what it is. When you sit in training classes, when you sit in an area-wide meeting, you get tons of certainty. You come here once a month, this is a pretty predictable format. We're going to have guests a couple. We're going to have the MDSMD meeting. We're going to probably speaker three out of four times. We're going to come in here. We're going to recognize top people in each category. They're going to give a little two, three, four, five minute rendition. Some people will go long. Some people will come up here and go, I had no idea I was supposed to speak today. Some people like stutter and stammer. Some people sound unbelievably eloquent. We get lots of cute little ideas. We'll get some nuggets. We'll get a leader or two like Nikki or Francis coming in here and really dropping some knowledge on us. We'll feel a little bit inspired. We'll feel a little bit challenged. Some of us have to get up early to go eat or do whatever we got to do, right? And then we sort of break. But if there's a tremendous amount of certainty. There's nothing really that shocking that happens. Is that true or not true? Yeah. Your Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night BPM, because in this audience we've got all three, tremendous amount of certainty. We've got pregame, and then we've got the Mozart, and we know what's going on with the Mozart, and we're going to have some guests, and we're going to break into classes, and here's the classes we're going to run, and here's probably the group of people that can be trained in these classes. One of these three people is going to do general training, and here's what we're going to get. And there's tons of certainty. See, of the six human needs, each one of us has two that are sort of dominant for us. They're not all equal. We have two of these six that are really dominant. And in my experience, and, and actually from what I've studied, what I've read, 
the most common of the six to be dominant in you is the need for certainty. Yes. How do you, how do you determine your need? Because people think they want something. Is do you take a look at how you act or how your life shows up? Is that how you? Yeah, and there's that's a good question. I um, I don't have time for that today, but we can take you through a pretty quick exercise to actually Robinson that the four, we. I, yeah. You were there. Yeah. He, if you go back through your notes, he took everybody through how you determine what your two dominant ones are and what you want them to be. It's in your notes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And then you can train them. Yeah. When you go through it again. Roger that, sir. What did I just create for her? Some right. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm like, yes. Yeah. So we've got this need to feel certain about things, and training fulfills that. Experience, on the other hand, is filled with tremendous amounts of variety or uncertainty. I make a phone call, I don't know if they're going to answer or not. They answer, I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know if they're going to be mad, I don't know if they're going to hang up, I don't know if they're going to like me, I don't know if they're going to jack me around, I don't know if they're going to give me objections, I don't know if they're going to say... There's tr all this uncertainty and variety with literally every call that I make. They show up as a guest. Are they going to show up dressed appropriately or inappropriately? Are they going to leave during Mozone? Are they going to stay for the BPM? Are they going to leave in the middle of the BPM and never come back? Are they going to stay during the BPM? Are they going to like it? Are they going to hate it? Are they going to say, I've seen it before? Are they going to run out of here? I have no idea what's going to happen. I bring them back for an interview or I set up a one-on-one. -on -one. I have no idea what they're going to say, whether or not they're going to be interested, what objections they're going to have, what questions. Are, like, I don't know what's going to happen. I sit down on an ASAP appointment. No matter how well I've been trained, and I know the scripts and the process and all this, I don't know how it's going to go. Are they going to edify me right? Is the person going to respond? Is the spouse going to be there? Is the dog or the kids going to interrupt? Like, I just don't know. Do they have a lot of money? Like Edson was talking about, do they not have enough money? Are they in the market? Are they out? I don't know. There's all of this uncertainty. Even the data collect, even the clothes. I get somebody recruited, then... Are they going to be a stud or are they going to be a dog? Are they going to go into the witness protection program? Am I never going to see them again? Am I going to invest a whole bunch of time and energy into them? A whole bunch of time and energy into them? And then they flake out on me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's all this uncertainty. And so experience is filled with uncertainty, which for most of us is not one of our dominant human needs. Most of us, one of our dominant needs is certainty. And so the more that I avoid these experiences, if I never make the call, I get total certainty. If I never prospect this chick, total certainty. Right? Right? If I never follow up with it, in total certainty. If I just keep coming to the trainings and go to the big events and get in on the conference calls, I get certainty, certainty, certainty. It's like, I read a great article yesterday, just like how phones are changing us. They're changing literally human behavior in a massive way, and we're not, we're completely unaware of it. It's like we have this gigantic bowl of candy in front of us at all times. It's just like, woo! 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 Right? Little sugar spike, sugar spike, sugar spike. Like, push a button, sugar spike, push a button, sugar spike. Right? Over and over and over. Right? It just constant. It's like, it's made, it's given us this unbelievable resource and access that we have instantly at our fingertips at all times. And at the same time, it's given us a level of distraction exponentially greater. Most of, our, most of us can't control ourselves have our hands in the cookie jar, have our hands in the candy bowl, and it's just like, <gasps> at the expense of what we really want. Because it's given us a lot of what we need. It's clicking those buttons. It's literally shooting massive amounts over and over and over of endorphins, right, that make us feel good. These things make us feel good. That's why they're so addicting. App developers literally are creating them in a way that causes us to be more and more addicted by pushing more and more of our buttons that release more dopamine and serotonin and all of these feel-good chemicals inside of us. It's like the cigarette manufacturers in the 50s. No, it's not addictive. Don't be selling it. All the cool kids are doing it. 
Meanwhile, behind the scenes, they're coming up with additives and chemicals and everything they can to make it more addictive. But they're pretending like, no, people just don't, they just lack self-discipline. But we're putting the shit in there to make it more addictive on purpose. Yeah. Right? Yeah. App developers are doing the same thing. Okay, so we've got this need for certainty and many of us avoid the uncertainty of the experience. When you think about how long you've been here, like Nikki was talking about earlier, I think it was Nikki, it might, might have been somebody else, but like when we're really frustrated, well, I've been here this long or this long or this long or this long, and here's where my business is, and here's where it should be, and here's where my cash flow is, it's because we've literally substituted training for experience. What we need is way more experiences filled with uncertainty, and what we keep thinking we need is more training, because here's what happens. I make the phone call, and they answer, and they say something bad. And then I make another one, I don't get a response. And, I make, and then, like, like you heard, uh, I don't know, I think it was Ricky or Mo saying, like, man, I made 50 calls, and I got three appointments. So that's 47 times I didn't get the desired result. 47 out of 50. That's not only tremendous uncertainty, it's like it doesn't feel good. None of those 47 feel good. So I got three little blips of feel good inside of the 50. Compared to, I pick up the phone, I can get 47 <clears throat> feel goods out of every 50 clicks probably, right? Yeah. So I'm constant like, but by doing this over and over, here's what happens. Number one, is it possible you just had a bad day getting three results out of 50? Yes. Is that possible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We talk about playing the law of large numbers. If he plays 50 a day, five, six days a week, he's at 250, 300, which puts him at 1,000 to 1,200 for the month. See, on a sample size of 50 or even 100 or even 150 calls, the numbers could be jacked up. Right. It's like I used an example last night. If we flip a coin, we could get heads or tails. True? Yeah. If I flip the coin twice, could I get heads twice in a row or tails yeah. twice in a row? Yes. yes. If I flipped it three times, could I get three heads or three tails? Yes. If I flipped it a hundred times, what are the chances I'm going to get a hundred tails in a row or a hundred heads? <laughs> Not very good, right? Because it's the law of large numbers. Eventually, like, it's just going to play out. The odds are going to play out eventually through a large enough sample size. True or not true? True. 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 We make 10 or 15 or 20 or maybe in Maurice's case, 50 calls, and the numbers don't play out in that sample size, and here's where we go. Based on the results I'm getting in my experiences, this isn't working. I must need more training. I need to look, something's not working. Because when I'm making this many calls, I should be getting better results. Either I'm not calling the right people, I need to learn how to call better people, I need to learn better what to say. And what, what he really needs is just to do more of the same. Let the law of large numbers play out, have more experiences. Here's what begins to happen. You start going three for 50 enough times in a row, you know what you begin to do? Get better quality numbers. Yeah. You just do. Why? Because the pain of this experience, of like, man, I'm putting in the work and not getting near enough results for how hard I'm working, after a while, fuels the frustration to, okay, I've got to, ch I've got to change the time I'm calling people, I've got to change the group I'm calling, I've got to change something because this is unacceptable. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. How many of you have been through Sam's 5 and 2 training, the, right, the whole big, right? And he starts with the premise like the real problem why more people aren't winning WFG is people don't prospect enough. They don't have enough good quality prospects, right? Mm -hmm. So you go through like the six or eight week program with him, which is amazing. You get the scripts, the processes, the psychology behind it all done. It's amazing. You get all this stuff down. And... Most people don't increase their numbers afterwards. Why? They don't practice it. They don't practice it because there's not a real need. So what you hear like Maurice talking about and Ricky talking about on the Friday morning calls, what you hear others talking about is, I'm going to sort of back my way in here. It's a sort of sideline phone. I think of all the things that you will need to do to be successful here, the number one thing that you need to do is have goals related to calls. 
whether you call it baseline units of activity or you call it something else, you heard Louise in there talking about it. She said, as a part-timer, Charlie said, you have to make 25 calls a day. As a part-timer. Now, as a part-timer, Louise was a part-timer that was from Coda to Casa that liked to have tea with the housewives of Orange County before there was housewives of Orange County. She was one of the OG housewives of the OC. Okay? And they'd be doing tea down in Coda in their little cars and their little right boutiques and their little fashionable outfits that they only wear once, right? That was Louise. And Dan just telling her, you got to make 25 calls a day, and she's just compliant, so she made 25 calls a day as a part-timer. When you've got a specific daily and weekly number that you need to hit, whether you're part-time or full-time here, here's what happens. It fuels your need for good names and numbers. Call them prospects, call them whatever you will. But it fuels the need. But if you don't have a number, like you hear Maurice, you hear Ricky, you, right? You hear Glenn, like if you don't have a number that you have to hit, then no matter how well you know the scripts and the process and the five and the two, there's really not a great need to do this. But when it's like, I've got to get this done, or like Ricky said, it, it really wasn't about me. I'm not making any money off his deal. But it's about me just helping to provide some accountability at a distance. He feels the pressure in a good way that he needs to hit the goal, hits the number. That drives him needing to find good quality names and numbers because after a while you get tired of making 50 calls and getting three results. So it's going to force you to get more and more numbers and better quality numbers. How many of you know what I'm talking about? As you're making more of these calls, all of a sudden, if you get only 10 people that answer out of 50 calls, there's no way you're going to tolerate three saying yes. So you hear some of the same excuses, some of the same objections over and over, and some of those seven that become no's are now going to start to become yeses. Because you're not going to let them off the phone that easily. You're not going to listen to the BS they're selling you. You're going to start to find questions to ask to shift the possibility of them meeting with you and coming down and being the guest row 101. Why? Out of necessity. You can go to all the trainings on the world. Michael Paul can teach exactly how to overcome objections and do this on the phone. Steve Adams can do it. Natalie can do it. But it's sort of in one ear and out the other because it's, it's on a need-to-know basis. And you don't really need to know it. It's not a have to. It's like good training and you sort of tuck it away for future use. But in the moment, when you're hitting this hard, whether that's 15 a day for you as a part-timer or 40 or 50 or 60 a day as a full-timer, all of a sudden it's like somebody starts talking about that and you hear a technique, you hear an idea, you hear a question, you hear All of a sudden it's like, I, okay, I gotta try that like today, because I'm tired of going three for fifty. I, get, I gotta get to five for fifty, or six for fifty, or seven for fifty, and it's out of all of this pain you're feeling that now I listen differently, I learn differently because of my experiences. Difference between experiences and training, huge difference. You don't need more training. You've got more than enough training. You've had too much training. What, what you are drum, what you are missing in massive ways is experience. You don't have enough experience. You've got exactly the amount of experience that provides you the size team you have and the income level that you have. That, that there's a direct correlation between how much experience you have and the size team you have and the cash flow that you have. If you want to increase your cash flow, want to increase the size of your team, you better start increasing your experiences, which are, by the way, filled with uncertainty. And missed opportunities. The more of them you have, the more this experience begins to pay off for you. Let me give you the second part of it that I think is the second part of it when you start making calls, start running appointments, start running one on ones. How many of you saw uh, like Edson's level of certainty when he yeah. was up here? You saw about a client that's making a half million dollars a year. I know what his cash flow is. He ain't, right? So there's a disparity there. But his level of certainty was through the roof. Here's what happens in the early stages, even when you like get validated, and I know what to say on the appointment, I know how to say it. Here's what happens, I believe, in most cases, 
just based on observation. You get more caught up with the feel good, love and connection need with your prospects on the phone and your one-on-ones and your appointments and your teammates and not enough with being significant. <clears throat> It's like, oh, with WFG, we just want to feel good, and we want to help people, we want to teach people and change the world, and we want to educate them, and we want to love them, and we want to make a difference, and it's just warm and fuzzy and wonderful, and everybody's just happy, and there's unicorns and pixie dust, and every day is all smiles. And you're so overweighted here, and you need to counterbalance with, I need to freaking kick some butt and get a recognize for something. I need to have the most guests. I need to be standing up with the most appointments or the most apps. I need to be number one in the category. I need to get paid. I need to hit the BBC. I need to qualify for MD so I can get invited to this stupid lunch at the convention breakup meeting. <laughs> right? I, I don't care if they sit on Facebook for an hour every month in there for... I want to be in there sitting on Facebook with the MDs and the SMDs. I'm it, it doesn't matter if the content's any good. I want to be one of them. It, you've got to bounce with, some, with a need for some significance. You've got to want to achieve, and that's about putting pressure on yourself to perform. It goes back to this whole thing of having specific goals and being accountable to someone because you choose to be not because they're chasing you down. <clears throat> when you choose that... You begin to drive your own behavior a different way through your experiences. You begin to use a mentor or a coach in a different way because when, you're, when you've got a daily number you got to hit and you're working at hitting it and then you're still not getting the results, you're like, wait a minute, I get that it was, like I can sort of accept the fact I wasn't getting results before because it's quite frankly I wasn't working that hard. But now I'm working my ass off and I'm still not getting results. This is frustrating. Tell me what I need to do. Now, you know, you know that saying that you guys love to quote? Like, when the student is ready, the master <laughs> appears. That's when the student's freaking ready. When the student's so frustrated because they're working so hard and it's not happening. Mm -hmm. yep. They're really paying the price. They're really doing all the work. And, and they have to learn, like, with all this work I'm doing, how do I get more results out of it? That's when the student is ready. That's when the student is ready. Okay. So you've got to have these daily, if there's nothing else you do, if you want to change the, like the trajectory of your career here forever, you've got to have a daily and a weekly number that you have to hit so it's non-negotiable. And you've got to share that and be accountable with somebody else. Just like Ricky was saying, like, if he wasn't, if he didn't just, I didn't make him accountable, I just, I like giving guys that are bigger than me a hard time. It's fun. <laughs> fun. Right? Because <laughs> my whole life, they were picking on me. Okay, time to turn the table. I like that. Right? <laughs> it gives me a lot of certainty. Right? <laughs> but if I didn't have that little conversation with him, he's not going to feel the pressure to get it done. By the way, he got, well, did you say 40 or 50? 40? 40. 40 done in 90 minutes. He's never done that in 90 minutes in his life. <laughs> but why did he do it yesterday? Because he wanted to get out of here. He had to get out of here. He started late, and so he just like didn't get distracted, didn't start checking all the bleeps on his phone, and just like made the calls. Just that was will, not skill. If you want to get great at making calls, you're going to get great at making calls by making a ton of calls. By default, what this is going to lead to is guests, one-on-ones, and ASAP appointments, our first appointments, KTPs, whatever you want to call them for the mix of crowd that we have. You first get great at making calls. You will next get great at this through the experiences of doing these. But not before you get great at this, because you're going to make way more of these, and this is going to lead to a fewer number of these, and it takes quite a few of these to get really good at it, to master it. From here, then you're going to get great at, like, closing. But not through a great field trainer's summit that we have or listening to a tape by failing to close a bunch of times, coming close to closing a bunch of times. They're really interested. They're going to do it just not now a bunch of times. That's, they close to you. You didn't close that. Make no mistake about it. Somebody's always closing either you or them. And Louise, she looks all cute and blonde. Go to the casa. Oh, see, right? 
she's a closer. Like Jim said, she makes a game out of it. She knows either she's going to close them on the phone or they're going to close her period of the story. And there's no other way to explain that event in her world. Now, for some of us, there's a whole bunch of other ways to explain, well, the timing's just not right, and they need to check with this. And No, they closed you or you closed them, period, end story. It's black and white. It's binary. It's like those classes you took in college that were dropped, that were pass or, or fail. There's no other, right? That's all it is. It's like taking your insurance exam. Pass, fail. There's no good grade. It's pass or fail, right? You'll get graded these through your experiences. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Which is filled with uncertainty in the beginning. After a time period of doing this, you get tremendous certainty on the phones. After a time period of doing this, you get tremendous certainty and tremendous certainty. But you can't get tremendous certainty without going through this long journey of uncertainty and lots of failures along the way. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Uh, one last point I'd like to hit on. We talked about it a little bit last night. It's called a recruiter's mentality. And it plays into what we're talking about. If you want to build a big business here, how many of you want a small business, say aye? How many of you want a really big business? Aye. aye. Really big business. Aye. aye. Turn to your neighbor and say, I want a huge butt business. I want a huge butt business. Huge butt business. <laughs> mentality, I want you to think about a gambler's mentality. What is a gambler thinking about gambling? All the time. <laughs> like at dinner with his wife and his kids? Yep. Yep. Yeah. At work all day? Yep. Yeah. Before he goes to bed? Yep. When he wakes up in the morning? Yep. It's all the time. That's all he's thinking about. He's obsessed with the next deal, the next wager, the next one's going to be a winner, right? When we talk about a recruiter's mentality, it's the same concept. It's the same concept. Most of you have already preordained yourself with a non-recruiter's mentality. Most of you have already said, I suck as a recruiter. I'm no good at recruiting. I'm not good at recruiting. I never had any experience recruiting. I don't understand this recruiting thing. I just want to make a bit much money here because they got great products and great services. I want to be that guy. Which is not even true at all. You don't have enough experience to know whether you're good or not good. Here's what we know. We literally have had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people recruit 10 or more recruits in a month. And some of them didn't even have a GED and some of them had a PhD. Some of them were 18 and some of them were 68 or older, theoretically, right? The friend, this guy I know that over there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of them were men. Some of them were women. Some of them speak English like the Queen's English. Some of them, it's sort of English. It doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. So recruiting is not something, a skill you have or don't have, a talent you have or don't have, a personality you have or don't have. It's none of those things. So for you to say, I'm not a good recruiter, or I'm just not good at that, or I've tried that before, you haven't tried it before. You haven't tried it enough to the extent where you become a good recruiter. That's the issue. You tried it enough to where you got some uncertainty. You decided you didn't like the way the uncertainty felt, so you went to the certainty of not trying to recruit. Because you've got to fill that need for certainty. Okay? Here's what I know. Uh, in our company, in case nobody told you this, I'm just going to come clean. Ours is a recruiting model. So you might want to consider getting great at it. Not good at it, great at it. You might want to just decide from a mentality standpoint... I'm going to be a great recruiter. I'm going to be the best recruiter they've ever seen. And maybe you'll miss that goal and become just a damn good recruiter. But better to shoot high when you're trying to create a new mindset, a new mentality. Just decide, I'm going to become a great recruiter. Because the fact of the matter is, you don't know yet. It would be unfair for you to label yourself anything short of a great recruiter at this point. Why would you do that? It's like, how many of you have kids or know somebody who has a kid? Like, before my kids go to kindergarten, I just go, look, here's the deal. You'll never be any good at math. You'll probably never be any good at English. You'll never be good at the sciences either. But uh, just sort of hang in there. 
Like, and imagine me and their mother keep telling them this over and over and over again. For what purpose? Now, is it possible I can tell them, you're the smartest, you're unbelievable, and they wind up not being very gifted at math. Is that possible? Yes. yes. But why would I preordain them bad at it? I would never do that as a parent. Why would you do that to yourself? It's just stupid. Stupid. So you've got to decide in advance that I can have a recruiter's mentality. What's the second thing I need to do? You've got to decide why, like Hope said, do I want to become a big recruiter? So as fast as you can right now, I want you to write notes like your doctor is writing a prescription for you right now. I want you to write notes as fast as you can, as illegible as possible. What are the three, four, five, six, eight, ten reasons why you want to have a big team here? What are they? Write them down real quick, fast as you can. Fast as you can. I don't even care if you can read them. What are all the reasons you want to have a huge team here? What are all the things a huge team is going to do for you? By the way, if you did this last night, it's okay to do it again. Because you want to keep convincing yourself why you want to have a big team. You want to keep selling yourself on all the reasons why. All right, what are some of the reasons? Shout them out loud. Legacy for my family. Excellent. Why else? Time off. Good. 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 Retire with them. Good. Retired by one. Excellent. Good. Excellent. Fabulous vacations. Excellent. Excellent. Mary Schleiman. Excellent. Travel. Excellent. All of these are good reasons. Are some of them better reasons than others? Yes or no? Yeah, some are better. But what's more important is that you ask yourself the right question. See, if I start out with a premise, I used this example last night. You ever have a bad day and you go, why does this always happen to me? Yes. We've all done that before, right? Yeah. As soon as you start with the premise that bad things happen to you, then you ask yourself a bad question called, why does this always happen to me? Your brain is a supercomputer. It's going to come up with an endless list of possibilities why bad things always happen to you. <clears throat> change the premise and change the question. It'll work just as powerfully for you as against you. Is it possible you've asked yourself that question more than once in life? Yes. It is, isn't it? Yes. So asking yourself this question, why do I want to have a big team over and over and over, begins to reinforce the right kind of mentality for you to create a great life for yourself over and over and over. You can't ask yourself this question enough times. Like every time you get in a car accident, you get a flat tire, you, your ATM gets rejected because there's not enough money, somebody on the phone tells you no, right? Every time something bad happens, the dog pees on the carpet, you just go, <laughs> why do I want to have a big team again? And let yourself answer with all the possibilities of why you want a big team, right? When you ask yourself, when you start with a powerful premise and you ask a great question, like, why do great things always happen for me? Why does life always work out great for me? That same supercomputer is going to come up with an endless stream of possibilities as to why that could be. You've got to take control of the programming of your brain. It starts here. So most people, when I say, hey, I'm talking about a recruiter's mentality, they talk about, okay, well, I don't know how or I don't know what to say, which is the wrong premise and the wrong question. So it's going to feed us all the wrong answers, an endless supply of those answers. The right premise and the right question is, why? Why? Why do I want to become a great recruiter? And let your brain begin to give you all the reasons why you want to become a great recruiter. Some of you don't want to become a recruiter. I just want to recruit a great recruiter and then they can be a great recruiter. <laughs> no! You want to be the great recruiter. It's like, I just want to like recruit a good quarterback. No, you want to be the quarterback. You want to be the point guard. You want to be the leading scorer, right? So you've got to ask the right question. Why? And it's 90% why and 10% how. 
most of us in this room, and then it gets even worse for our part-timers that aren't here, it's 90% obsession on how to recruit and what to say and 10% on why. And that obsession with the how-tos and the what-tos in disproportion to the why-tos causes us to have limp recruiting numbers, weak recruiting numbers. You've got to make sure that you're constantly asking, why do I want to have a big team? Why do I want to have? And if you if you get clear on all of these answers, you'll figure out the how to and the what to. Quick example. We decided anybody who gets five recruits on their team this month. Anybody who gets, and then the mic dropped, right? Anybody who gets five recruits on their team this month gets into the MDSMD leadership meeting next month. How many of you would get five? Any of you who gets five directs a month for the next consecutive 12 months, I will personally give you $100,000. Think of what $100,000 is going to do to change your life. hundred grand. You get five directs a month for the next 12 months, I'll personally give you, I'll write you a check, and it'll be good for hundred grand. How many of you believe that you could do five directs a month for the next 12 months? Say aye. 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 But, but how are you going to do it? <laughs> what are you going to say? You're not even thinking about all that. Why? Because the why is big enough. Here's the fact of the matter, knuckleheads. If you get five directs a month for the next year, you're going to make way more than 100 grand here. Hello? Do you know how the comp plan works? But... We're spending so much time getting caught up in the how-to and the what-to that we're completely missing what... See, once you are clear on why I have to do it, you're going to do it. So recruiter's mentality, you've got to be focused on the why. Then number two is you've got to decide. I was rereading re Swanwin's book, and they said this. When they analyzed Swan's business over decades and decades, here's what they found. Here's what they found that the individuals that did 10 recruits in a month for their first time ever. How many of you have never done 10 recruits in your business in a month, say aye? So people like you that had never, ever done it before, that the number, I, I don't think, remember the exact number, but I believe it's right around 70% of them did it in less than 10 days. Didn't even take 30 days. Why? Because when people just like you made a decision that they were going to be a double-digit recruiter, once they made that decision, it's like everything began to fall into place. Because they're so clear, it's like, I'm going to do this no matter what. Like Ricky's saying, I'm going to hit my 40 no matter what. He did it in an hour and a half. I guarantee you he's never done it that fast. But he made a decision. I'm not, like, this dude already called me out. I'm not going to not hit my number. So even though it's late, I'm just going to do it no matter what. And he just did it. He didn't figure out, like, how am I going to do it? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? He just, like, did it. We've all had those experiences where we just did something. Right? When you make a real decision that you're going to do double-digit recruiting, that something like 40% of them, it took a week. Something like 40% of them, it took a week. Of the people who had never done it before and did it for the first time. You've got to have, begin to build a recruiter's mentality, and then you just got to make a decision. Hey, this month, right now, me and my team are doing it. If they don't do any, I'll do it all myself, but it's going down this month. When you make a real decision, that's the way things go. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to get in the business of getting as much experience as you can this week. And between this month and next month's meeting, I want to challenge you to make the experiences you have in WFG outweigh the training that you go through in a ratio of 10 to 1. I don't want your, the number of hours in training and meetings and conference calls to be greater <coughs> than the amount of hours you have in experiences. What do I mean by experiences? You're on the phone with the prospect, you're sitting kneecap to kneecap with the prospect. That's experience. Not reading about it, not talking about it. I'm talking to prospects live, I'm talking to prospects face to face. I want the amount of time you commit to being 
creating those experiences for yourself to outweigh the amount of training that you get 10 to 1. If you do that over the next month, here's what I know will happen for you. Your skills are going to go up. Your confidence at level is going to go up. And you're going to begin to build the kind of momentum where your team size and your cash flow will go up. Because that's how you get teams and cash flow here. It's through those experiences, not through training. I want to challenge you to do that, number one. Number two, I want to challenge you to make a decision to go out and do double-digit recruiting between now and next month's meeting. I want to see some people up here next month and go, I thought that dude was crazy, and I still think he is. But I, I just decided, and I wasn't sure how I was going to do it, but I decided I was going to do it. Because if you want to have a big team here eventually, you can't put off getting the double-digit recruiting. You can't put it out like, the sooner you get there, the sooner your chances of building a big team. But you can't let another month and then convention and then the end of the year and then the wealth will roll by and you still haven't done it because you think you need more training. You've got to make a decision. This is the way this deal works. If I'm going to get rich here like a whole bunch of other people, if I'm going to change my life here like a whole bunch of other people, it's going to be because I became a double-digit recruiter. I'm doing that this month. And what I want to do is have everybody that does 10 recruits or more this month, the next 100 days, I want to hear from each and every one of them next month because I think those will be the most powerful talks that we have. So if you want to right now guarantee your spot up here next month and sharing what you've really learned, you're going to learn a buttload over the course of the next month when you make that decision to follow through on it. How many of are on board? Say aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> Barry White is complete. <laughs> Thank you.